Thank you so much, Yusuf. So, there's a 1980s film. We've got a 1980s skateboarder here today, but I want to bring mention a 1980s film called Time Bandits. I'm seeing some people remember the film, and there's this great scene. Like it's been years since I remember I've seen the film, but I remember this one scene. The main characters they're trekking across this barren wasteland, and all of a sudden, bam! They smack into something. They can't go forward. They've run into an invisible barrier. And one of the greatest lines in a movie of all time, from my perspective, is, so that's what an invisible barrier looks like. Uh -uh. I'm glad one person laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today at Skate Against Hate to talk about what does it mean to be a community of inclusion, a community of justice, and we've got to go deeper with this conversation. A lot of our, the ways we've talked about inclusion and justice so far, they came out of the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where we had laws on the books and practices in the, that were in their face exclusive. There was no invisible barrier about whether or not you could, who could sit in the front of the bus or the back of the bus. There was nothing invisible, invisible about having blacks only schools or whites only drinking fountains. It was visible, it was clear, it had a clear intent and it was in your face. But now we look at today, and we see that a lot of those laws, a lot of those visible barriers have gone away. We still have tremendous uh, disparities in terms of racial inequality, gender inequality, uh, sexuality inequality. So why is that happening? What, what keeps that going? And part of what makes that happen is we have a number of invisible barriers that are helping, that are, keep things unequal. We've got a situation where you can have laws and rules that are on their face, not racial, not gendered, but they have the effect of having unequal consequences. And last night, some of you may have heard, there was a football game. A few people went to it. And if you were at that football game, or if you've been at any major sporting event, you can see some of these invisible barriers, or, or rock concerts, music concerts, because you, you look at the bathrooms, and you'll see one bathroom will always have a line, and the other one won't, right? So you, the, the women's room will always have a line. Now on its face, it's equal, right? You've got the same number of stalls, the same number of vessels in both the men's and the women's room, but you've still got this different outcome. And we can't fix that different outcome unless we talk about it. So when we're looking at, when we're looking at gender, that's an example that we see every sporting event, every music concert, about how we can have these invisible barriers. Things that are on their face equal, but still have a disproportionate impact on one group or another. When Yusuf, Yusuf's our state rep here in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, I'm on city council. Every time we campaign, Yusuf and I see another one of these invisible barriers as it comes to race and class. When we're trying to get elected, we knock on the doors of the people we think are most likely to vote. We, send, we spend the money to send direct mail to the people we think are most likely to vote. And who are those people? They tend to be older, they tend to be whiter, they tend to be more affluent, and they tend to be better educated. And so people who are in those categories are getting the message, hey, we care about you, we expect you to vote, we're going to remind you to vote, we're going to listen to your issues. And the people who aren't in those categories that aren't like regular voters get the message, your politicians don't care, they don't come, they don't listen, they, don't, they, they throw you away. This is what we have to do to get elected. But that reinforces a system, a structure, that keeps some people out of power and some people in. The impact of that was very clear to me. A couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago, there was an incident at Blake Transit Center where a young man uh, was, had interaction with police. I'm not going to get into the details of that situation, but people were saying, hey, Chuck, what's going on with this? What's going on? I said, okay, let me see what I can find out. And so I decided I was going to email our city administrator, our city attorney, our police chief, and the head of the AAA uh, Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority. So here I am, I'm a white guy, emailing our city administrator a white guy, our police chief a white guy, city attorney a white guy, transit head a white guy. This is part of what these invisible barriers do, is they help keep this se separation where some people are getting support, and not, but not everybody is. I see another invisible barrier every time I do something with my school's, my daughter's school's uh, parent-teacher organization. My daughter attends Ebroid Elementary School, not far from here. At Ebroid Elementary School, they have a fantastic PTO. 
They've got people who do amazing things. They've got great people who give uh, enrichment activities. A lot of people volunteer their time. We've got university professors making this happen, corporate sponsors helping us put on our events. It's incredible. It really is. And I'm so grateful that my daughter has all the supports that that PTO offers. Those supports are on top of the supports that the school district and our public schools also offers. You know, uh, really good teachers, really good administrators, fantastic facilities. But here's the thing. You cross 23, you go to Ypsilanti, and you've got another school district. You've got Ypsilanti Community Schools. Ypsilanti Community Schools gets a lower per pupil funding allocation from the state of Michigan than Ann Arbor Public Schools. Ypsilanti's, pu Ypsilanti's PTO doesn't have the same ability to raise funds. Ypsilanti's PTO doesn't have the same network of professionals to tap in to do their enrichment for their kids. It's not just what's happening, what, what are the kids coming into the classroom, but the, the students in Ipsy are getting less support from the state and from, the, from their PTO than the students in Ann Arbor. And so when we look at an achievement gap, people, some people want to blame the kids. I don't blame the kids. I blame the invisible barriers. So what we all have to do is we need to start find, seeing these barriers. You know, for me, as a white guy, as a straight guy, as somebody who's cisgendered, a lot of these barriers are, are invisible to me. For people who are not in those categories, they, they're running up against these barriers all the time. They see them. So for what, what, do we, what does it do when we confront these invisible barriers? First of all, we need to see them. If we're not seeing them, we need to be listening to the people who are seeing them and learning from their experience. We need to be telling other people about them to make sure that other people are realizing, hey, that there is an invisible barrier. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to work together in that movie, Time Bandits. What did the Time Bandits do when they ran into that invisible barrier? Well, they argued about it. They got mad. And one of the people picked up a, a rock or a, a bone or something like that in this way and threw it and smashed the invisible barrier so they could get through, so they could, get it, they could advance. That's the work we need to be doing here with Skate Against Hate, here with organizations like Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, Jim Toy Center, Friends of the Skate Park, and um, Peace Neighborhood Center. So I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to hand the mic over to Yusuf so we can invite our next speaker.